What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I'm Kelvin Thompson. And I'm Tom Cavanaugh. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Hey, Tom. Hey, Kelvin. How's it going? It's going well. It's another beautiful spring day in Central Florida. In lockdown? In lockdown, yes. I get to experience it briefly uh, <laughs> during the day when I go outside and eat my lunch, or in the evening if I take a little walk, I'll walk down to the mailbox and try to enjoy the, the beautiful weather we have. But um, yeah, I'm ready to be outside more than I am. Yeah. I mean, this is this whole remote work thing is interesting, but I, I've got to say I'm kind of looking forward to the day that we'll be back in the office, I think. It's a uh, weird thing too. to say, but I think so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, there's, we are social creatures, right? Isn't that what they say? That's what they say. Yep. So... I think right before we hit record, Tom, you said that you got new coffee. I did. What are you drinking? Well, it's it is new. Uh, You know, I've I've been drinking some of the same stuff since we've been in lockdown, but uh, today is um, it's a Brazilian arabica, a hundred percent, medium roast, and it's from a company called Sea Bean Coffee Company. And it's in West Palm Beach, Florida. This was a gift from my brother-in-law and uh, cracked it out for a special occasion. So uh, it's good. I'm impressed. That sounds like some legit coffee you got going on there. (laughs) Yeah, it's brewed down in West Palm. I think they got bought by another local uh, like shop or distributor or something, but, uh, but I think they do their roasting there. Cool. Well, I hope you don't mind again, but I have uh, also... This episode as well thematically selected my cup of coffee uh, today. It is uh, very tasty. It uh, is recently roasted single origin Guatemala, uh, just right for the pour over brewing method that I used uh, a little while ago to make this cup of coffee. This coffee comes to me from Equator Coffee in San Rafael, California. And it was actually recommended to me by an online service called Trade Coffee which is kind of cool because they match you up with coffees based on your preferences and your coffee behaviors, and they guarantee that you'll like your first coffee. So this is my first coffee, and I, and, I, and I like it. So I really wish I could be sharing it with you, Tom, despite our coronavirus remote work. But I'll just ask, can you find a connection between my coffee selection and today's episode? Wow. Um... Uh, I was thinking of the same connection I had, and I'm sure this is not it, but that they're both uh, not American. Oh. Um, <laughs> yep, they are I'm, both not American. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and that is that is something to do with our episode today. That's um, true. But I don't know. Why don't you elucidate me, Dr. Thompson? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more uh, one more uh, shot at it, right? So this is this coffee oh, comes wait, from I think e- I Equator it. Coffee. Equator Coffee, mm-hmm. and um, they also have this uh, this this matchup system that kind of is based yeah. on your own unique preferences and coffee behaviors. Uh, gotcha. So yes, it, uh, I should have been attending to that portion that's of the all right. description. That's okay. Um, all right. So yes, I do get it. Um, all right. Equator. So mm-hmm. our, our guest this episode is from you know down under. Down and, under. Um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, some some really interesting online practices that use adaptive learning and uh, match sort of needs with instructional content. So I get it. You are the sort of the the Amazon recommendation engine of coffee or the stitch fix where you put in your preferences and you get the shirts that you like or however that go. works. That's right. Yeah. That's 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 right. That's okay. that's right. 
That's a good connection. So um, uh, before we get into the specifics, I'll just say that uh, a little preamble here. Back during episode 56, which was the last mile getting STEM online, we spoke about some of the challenges at UCF and elsewhere of STEM faculty embracing online and blended design and teaching. And we spoke from our vantage point as online education people, but we promised some follow-up from actual STEM faculty. Now, today's interview episode is related to curricular innovations in one of the STEM fields, engineering, but it is certainly not a direct response to episode 56. However, it does help us as online educators better understand some of the priorities and challenges of the STEM community. So just a little preamble there. So, Yeah, and if I can make one comment on that, um, what we've experienced in this remote teaching transition um, has, in at least at our institution, probably the same elsewhere, inordinately affected the STEM community because yeah. they are most often teaching face-to-face, -face, and we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. But I think what you are about to hear in this interview, and we'll get to who I talked to in a moment, is a really great example of the difference between the kind of immediate remote teaching of STEM content as contrasted against the kind of well thought out, rigorous designed online STEM content that could be done with, you know, intentionality and planning and support. So that's the difference between maybe online learning and um, remote instruction. I think this is, this is one example of that. Yep. So Tom, you interviewed Dr. Ewan Lindsay during his visit to UCF during 2019. So do you want to tell us about our guest? Yeah, absolutely. I, I very much enjoyed the conversation and the visit that, uh, that Ewan and his colleagues made to UCF. So Dr. Ewan Lindsay is Director of Engineering for Charles Sturt University in Australia, down under. Ewan visited UCF uh, to compare notes on an adaptive learning system that each of our institutions uses. But we were quite taken by the innovative approach to engineering um, that, that Charles Sturt University uses. And we'll link to his professional bio in the show notes if you want to know more. But it's probably worth noting that Ewan Lindsay's PhD is in engineering education. And his dissertation research involves studying how students learn when controlling physical equipment remotely via the internet. I think that is very relevant. Um, as you can see, he's a thoughtful guy. Uh, he's passionate about what they're doing, and they're doing some really cool, innovative things that I think a lot of us could learn from um, down there and at Charles Sturt. So, Tom, any comments you want to make in addition to that before we cut to the interview? Uh, no, let's talk about it on the other side and um, maybe reflect a bit. So through the magic of time, of podcast time travel, as we usually say, right? Here is the interview with Dr. Ewan Lindsay. Ewan, thank you for being on TopCast. Oh, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, you are here in muggy Orlando, Florida from Charles Sturt University in Australia. Um, why don't maybe you start by telling us a little about Charles Sturt and um, where it is in Australia, maybe a little bit about the, the size of the institution, maybe if there's any particular focus or mission. Yeah, absolutely. So Charles Sturt University is in regional New South Wales. So Sydney's the capital of New South Wales. It's a large city. It's surrounded by a mountain range. But if you go west of the Blue Mountains into regional New South Wales, you've got an area of Texas, same size as Texas, uh -huh. um, not the same weather. It's very cold there right now. So I wouldn't say muggy. I'd say beautiful Florida. Um, <laughs> but... We are the regional university once you get west of the Blue Mountains. Uh, Charles Sturt is a multi-campus institution. We've got seven different physical locations. We were formed by the merger of regional colleges of advanced education, the uh, teachers' colleges and things like that back in 1989. And so we have a very strong community engagement mission. Um, a very, we have about 45,000 students, okay. I think. Wow. But the majority of those are part-time students. A lot mm -hmm. of them study online or they're studying at the local campus because that's the only place that they can get access to education. And so it's very much Charles Sturt University or not going to university. Right. And that changes the tone of, of where you are. Now, in my hometown of Bathurst, which is the first town past the Blue Mountains, it's about a three-hour drive from Sydney, we're about 16% of the economy there. And so... A lot of universities talk about engaging with their communities. We are our community. We are the people right, that are affected right. by the decisions that we do. And so there's a very different social licence to operate when you work there. And 
at Chalster, one of the things that we realised, and this was, we had to realise that industry was poking us, for all of the size that we have and for all of the mining that's done in our physical footprint, all the food that is grown in our physical footprint, all of the, the people who live out there in the country and have roads and whatever else that need to be built, there was no engineering school. Hmm. So Charles Sturt Engineering, which is the school that I'm the head of, has only been open for four years and it's been in response to a shortage of civil engineers in country New South Wales. That They haven't been able to get those graduates to come out and work there. Experienced engineers, just it never occurs to them to cross the sandstone curtain and go out where the wildlings are <laughs> and get their get a career and it's a beautiful place to work. Regional Australia is a beautiful environment to raise your kids but if it never occurs to you that there is a career out there to be had, you don't think to go and work there. And so, so we, you had a blank slate then basically to create an engineering school and an engineering curriculum, which is an opportunity I think not a lot of people in, in that field would have had. Absolutely. And I, I thought when they approached me and said, would you be interested in this opportunity? I thought it was an opportunity. What an amazing chance. Yeah. I can build this without any of the baggage. What you discover when you get the blank page is it's actually an obligation because everybody else is looking at you going, well, if I had a blank page, I could do all this stuff. And so there's a real need to not just build what everybody else does. Right. And smart kids who want to grow up to be engineers from regional New South Wales, there's already some well-established grooves of the, they go down to Sydney and they study in the Sydney universities mm -hmm. and that's a great path. So if our degree was going to be the same as the ones they were already used to leaving the country to go and study, there'd be no reason for them to actually come and study with us. And if you look at the, the higher, higher education future, the horizon issues of where we're at, there's so much disruption coming into our industry at the moment that if you're just going to build a generic product, it's going to be dead in 15 years. Like there's no, it's, it's not a sustainable model to say, let's just take this blank page and run it through a photocopier. And so you think it's a great opportunity of, oh, I could do it without all this baggage. But what you've actually got is an obligation to do something that nobody else is able to do because the big places that have the resources are too big to turn around. Right. Um, UCF accepted, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and the, the small places that have that flexibility and the agility don't have the spare people. They're too small. They're too busy running on the hamster wheel to, to keep it all going that they don't have the time to reinvent themselves. And so I had the precious luxury of being given a blank page, but also an organisation that realised it, it needed to, to, to reinvent itself and to look to that horizon and was willing to invest in a new engineering school that did things differently as, as a sandbox for what the rest of the organisation could be. So that's what um, so intrigued me and, and why we're so thrilled to have you on the show, because the curriculum that you have developed I, is, is really innovative and it uses adaptive learning and uh, experiential learning and kind of internships and, you know, you name it. It kind of has a, has a little bit of everything, but in a very cohesive, uh, intentional design. So I wonder if you can, <laughs> in, a, in a few minutes... 25 words or less? Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Yeah, 180 <laughs> characters or whatever, to, to yeah. just sort of describe um, uh, what is different about it. So this Charles Sturt University engineering degree, is it's a five and a half year degree. So we take entry point is the standard school lever. And the exit point, they exit with a Master's of Engineering. They spend three semesters working face-to-face -face for me as student engineers. And so I give them authentic, realistic problems and I pay them in marks. They do good work, I give them bonuses. After they've completed three semesters with us, we then put them in industry for four one-year industry placements. So they go out and work as cadet engineers in real engineering organisations. They do real work for real people with real jeopardy attached. Mm -hmm. They get paid real dollars and then they build portfolios of those experiences and bring them back to us. So we're not looking at can they solve our third year statics and structures equation. We're looking at them to bring us a structure they have designed and it's actually been built and it's actually been certified. And that jeopardy really focuses the mind because they're, they're actually doing work that is, and actual is the word I use. It's not authentic, it's not realistic, it's actual work. If you do it wrong, there's ripples and consequences. Yeah. The underpinning technical content we deliver online, on demand, in a, I'll use air quotes, sorry guys, <laughs> a Netflix style curriculum. Mm -hmm. Because what we found is that traditional curricula are organised into three credit hour subjects of stuff that mostly fits together. And that's fine if it happens to be a three credit hour granularity, but if it's two and a half, then you've got two weeks at the end of the sort of related, and they're the two weeks that should have been in the three and a half credit hour subject that followed it. Right. And so a lot of that sorting is artificial for the sake of our timetables. It's artificial for the sake of trying to work out who should teach it or which semester it needs to go in. But when you're 
in industry looking to understand if this trust is going to buckle, you don't want to say, oh, well, I'm going to leave that a year because buckling's in third year. <laughs> you want to say, oh, I need to learn about buckling. What do I need to know to be able to learn buckling? And so we built our topic tree where we unpacked and it's pretty much the same as everybody else's civil engineering curriculum, but its granularity is the three-hour topic. And so the idea is that you progress your way along the branches of our tree, um, you, you binge in the Netflix style, right. at the point at which you need it or you're, you're told you need it or you realise you need it or you're just inspired to go and do some water treatment right now. So you and don't have to follow the prescribed path. Uh, you, as long as you have the prerequisites, you can kind of follow your area of interest or need or requirement in, until that sort of runs out. Yeah, so we, we don't have for, forced prerequisites. It's all soft prerequisites. So the way we, we built the tree was I asked my team of faculty what order should students do these topics in. What we find is that if they go in the right order, the order we recommend, the median self-reported completion time for a three-hour topic is three hours and five minutes. If you skip one, surprisingly enough, it's closer to six. Yeah. If you skip two, somehow the next topic takes you nine and it's amazing how they want to skip ahead and that's yeah. all cool but they quickly the, learn I bet. so so it's yeah. weird i mean do they have that freedom when you say this is the right answer and this is where you should learn it and people with lots of expertise have said go this way do they have the opportunity do they have to take that advice um it's the main reason we didn't force the prerequisites is that if you need to learn that because you're actually doing it in practice you don't want to have to do an online quiz to prove that you get part a and then an online quiz to prove the next one. And don't worry, we do a lot of automated assessment online mm -hmm. quizzes and so on. You want to get through the understanding because you don't need our quiz to reinforce what you're learning. You have a real example in front of you that needs to go out the door under the principal engineer's signature on Thursday. That's the demonstration in your mind. So the learning materials need to be accessible. We didn't want to firewall them because you haven't got around to doing this piece of assessment. So we wanted it to be a learning resource that enabled you to progress, not sort of a sequence of quests that you had to unlock the next one. Right. So we thought hard prerequisites would, would block people, that if you do need to jump ahead because this is what you're doing, you're not being stopped because you haven't gone back and done the assessment piece in the topic. You can do the one and a half hours of learning and then use the, the practical piece as and the exercise. that probably gives you more flexibility for the kinds of corporate placements that you put them in, because it could be almost anything that they would encounter. Um, it, well, it's civil engineering, but yeah. the, certainly the range of whether you're in local government or consulting or you're working on a That's mine site I mean, or, yeah. or so on. And so what we've got, essentially, there are core topics on the tree that everyone must have before we'll place them with a host. You know, you can't go out unless you understand continuity or equilibrium. There's some right. core concepts that they would throw the cadets back. There's core concepts that every civil engineer must know and then there's concepts that the structural engineers must know, there's structural concepts that the geotechnical engineers must I know. See. And so there's much like a normal course, right? There is three point subjects or, that everyone must do. There's a core civil, there's core by discipline. But for us, we've broken it down to what would you actually deny them graduation for if they didn't know? And while structures three may be the three credit hour answer, not all of that is essential for every civil engineer. Some of it is, and you can't get out without it, but then you have to do the other four weeks of that subject because that content's in there. So by unpacking it, we've been able to, to build that on-demand process. And, and what we're finding is they don't want one episode of design, one episode of circuits, one episode of materials, two episodes of maths every week. They want to binge their way up however many topics that are in the content area that they're working on. Yeah. And it's... It's that, that realisation that this is more how they consume media. It's how they engage with every other learning experience. I mean, if they want to learn how to make a cake, they look it up on YouTube, they have a crack, right. they taste it, they call their mum and go, what did I do wrong? <laughs> they don't yeah. go to BKG 201 Cakes in Modern Society and sit through 12 <laughs> weeks of lectures with some thermodynamics and the ethics of free-range eggs. Yeah. They get into it, they do it. That's how people learn everywhere but at university. And so we looked at it and said... This is this model and talking at people thing isn't working anymore. It's never who we've really been as Charles Sturt University, but it's an increasingly untenable model. And so we need to get to something that is built around that practitioner identity, but also gives you that flexibility to add that bit of extra learning when you need it. So are you different at Charles Sturt University, your curriculum, or are there other disciplinary areas, other faculties or colleges that... Um, that are doing similar kinds of innovation? Uh, so we are different because we were set up to go and be different. We were set up to be on the frontier. What we're finding is that it is having an impact on the rest of the institution. Um, if you know the concept of the Overton window, yes. the, the range yeah. of acceptable thoughts, yeah. well, we've just made that wider. Yeah. And so the people <laughs> who were near the middle of the old one are now pointing out at engineering saying, look what they do. 
what we want to do is actually very simple. And so I think our accounting degrees went cut back from 32 exams in 32 subjects to 28 exams in 32 subjects because engineering has no formal exams. Mm -hmm. And so 28, yeah, it's nothing, whatever, approved, off you go. Right. We're finding that, that that idea that everything has to be a standardised size subject is, is, is now weaker. You know, people are looking at other opportunities. The, the new workplace learning policy has evolved in light of the way in which we place our cadet engineers on whole year-long placements that aren't just 12 weeks for the sake of the subject. And so there's sort of ripples starting to form. Um, the challenge is that, again, even within the institution, we've got some very large colleges and they have some very large programs and you want to be sure that you're not about to destroy it as yeah. you change it. You want sure. constructive evolution. But they're looking at us and cheering us on because they can see things that they want to do. They can see dimensions of our program that will help enhance what they do in their context. Gotcha. So one of the things that seems to me that is um, required to kind of facilitate this innovative curriculum that you've designed and, and frankly how we were introduced to each other is because we're both using the same adaptive learning platform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how critical is the use of adaptive learning in order to to make this vision come true? Um, it's essential, um, but there's many layers of adaptive learning. So, I mean, there's the big brother is watching you, tracking every key click and changes everything you see in response to that. We're not quite at that. We're, we're adaptive in the sense of you can change whichever pathway that you need through your curriculum. And we're certainly- Well, and it's also non-linear. Yes, it's non-linear, um, but it is still a perpetually forward moment. I mean, you mm -hmm. can go back and loop, uh, but w we don't, at this stage, we haven't evolved our topics to the point where if you make this particular mistake, it'll give you different feedback and things like that. Right. So those kinds of tools are things that we're looking to embed. And we're constantly overhauling the tree. But at the moment, our main goal is growing the tree fast enough to stay in front of our student engineers. Um, but the analytics that we get out of understanding where our student engineers are going, that if you've been traditionally on a path of doing five topics a week and suddenly you're down to two, there's something changed in your life. Mm -hmm. And so we can just nudge whoever it is that's mentoring your team and goes, is Tom okay? Is he all good? Just, yeah, yeah he stopped doing topics. What's happened? And it's all good. Tom's happy. He's just been on holidays. Um, <laughs> he went off fishing for a week. It's great. So that ability to, to collect the data, I think, is there. We, we've got the groundwork for it, but we haven't got as much of that proactive piece. We've got the very passive responsive stuff. We've got that, here's a a parameterized question with a beam and there's loads, type in the correct number and every student gets a different version of that and they can get feedback if they used a cos instead of a sign. Mm -hmm. But we, we haven't got the, I get the Netflix recommender piece in it that, you know, yeah. you, you seem to be enjoying water quality. You should try flocculation as the next <laughs> subject. Flocculation, look it up, guys. You can Google it. Um, <laughs> we'll so, put a link in the show notes. No, thank you. So, so I think there is a lot of room to grow there. Um, and what we've, this is part of why we're here at UCF, is, is that you guys are very good at that, providing alternative pathways through the content, but you're doing it at that traditional three-point course. Right. So you've got three-point courses that are bundled together that are very responsive to what the student needs today, whereas we've got that unpacked curriculum, which is very responsive to what the student needs this month. And you've got a much more of a, I don't know if you would describe it like this, but it's much more of a competency-based sort of design. Mm -hmm. the, the, the curricular tree that you showed yesterday when yes. we were talking um, covered about two years worth of content, but it wasn't I couldn't tell by looking at that tree, okay, here's course one, here's course two. It was sort of the student could, could kind of make of it what they needed to. Yeah, well, so one of the challenges is that the disciplines don't always map to courses neatly. Like right. when does statics end and dynamics begins? And I can't get a, a great answer from any, from even from my team. We all have different backgrounds. We think it's slightly yeah. different. And so the course is a convenient label that we needed to be able to scale up from just the monks reading out books to non-monks to the higher ed system that we've had for the last 50 years, but it's not the right answer going forwards. You can have different sizes. The standardization is what you need to get to massification, but it's not what you need to get to universal access. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we found that, I mean, we do color code it of where we say this is where this branch changes to, to this branch, um, but the student engineers are more, what are the concepts that I need? What, what's the piece, or what has my mentor said? You know, is that going to buckle? Bring me the buckling calculations. It doesn't matter what you call buckling, you know, structural analysis or you know, physics or whatever you call it. It's called buckling on yeah. the tree. You is need to go and do break? it. <laughs> yeah, is yeah. this going to break? And, but you know why you need it at the time. 
Um, and so we, we've, I guess, had the luxury of, of being able to do away with those, um, those, those artificial boundaries between courses. Um, another phenomenon that's amazing is how often something that you teach in year 12, a week 12 of year two, you then have to teach again in week two of year three right? because they need to go again. Um, and so by saying, let's put it on the tree once, let's do a mastery-based model of we will credit you that topic when you actually show you understand it, when you are competent, um, then we can do it once and we can move on. You can always refer back to it, but we're not in that, well, I talked at you about it in week 12, so I'm going to assume you knew it, right. and then discover the next time we try and use it that you didn't remember a thing. Great. Well, it's a fascinating uh, curricular redesign. Uh, I think it's, it's cutting edge, and I agree with you that it is, it is probably the future, and so you're living in the future, or the rest of us are, are on our way. Uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to talk to us today on TopCast about what you're doing down under. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here, Tom. Thanks for having me. Sure. Well, that was your interview with you and Lindsay, and, and Tom, that Ewan's a pro. That's not the first time he's talked about this stuff. No, uh, no, obviously not. Uh, but I still very much enjoyed the conversation, uh, learned a lot during their visit as well as during that conversation. And, um, and what they're doing there, I just think is so innovative from a curricular standpoint, but also from just a pedagogical standpoint, mm -hmm. this, this idea of what he was calling the Netflix style curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've been hearing for years, well, why can't education be more like Amazon, where they kind of know what you want, or games, or other kinds of predictive kind of engines. And it seems like they're getting closer to that than anybody else that I've talked to in recent memory, where you can offer just-in-time, on-demand educational nuggets that meet a particular educational purpose, and it's non-linear. But by the time you're all done, you have everything that you need, and it's mm -hmm. been applied in practice. I just mm -hmm. think it's really interesting. No, I agree with that. But I, I appreciate his depth of reflection on that too, right? That you binge at your point of need and that point of need could be you're told you need it or you realize you need it or you're just, I love his word, inspired, right? Yeah, but, yeah. But the, the idea of the soft prerequisites that, that you might be inspired, but if you don't follow the prerequisite, soft prerequisite pathway, you might spend a lot more time on it than if you did. So I thought that was really, really uh, interesting. Yeah, agreed. Um, they're, they're doing some, as you say, interesting things down there in, <laughs> in Australia. And, uh, and good for them. Uh, the idea of having that blank page, what he calls that obligation to try something different mm -hmm. instead of just being another one of the crowd in a typical sort of engineering program. Not there's anything wrong with that. We have that mm -hmm. at our institution mm -hmm. and it works well. But to have the total freedom of movement to come up with something completely new and design it from the ground up as a, a completely new model, uh, what an opportunity. How often do you get that? And uh, I, they seem to be taking full advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And can I just say that this stuck out to me when, when we talked to them on site and it stuck out again listening to the interview. I love that phrase, with real jeopardy attached. You know, there's yeah. that job placement with real jeopardy attached. There's learning for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. If you're at risk of having your bridge fall down, <laughs> that's real jeopardy. But as he was quick to point out that there would be a senior, you know, yeah, 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 certified yeah, yeah. engineer yeah, that yeah, would yeah. sign off on the work. But even so, but, there are yeah. that's that's a real practical application. That's not some textbook abstract assignment. If you're sitting there and you have to solve this problem and that you know there are consequences if you don't do, get it right. Wow. That's the crucible of of real world education, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, I, I just can't. I'm, I'm find this very compelling as well. The the comparison that he made of the uh, students using YouTube to find out how to make a cake and then giving it a try and then calling mom for backup. Where did I go wrong? Versus, you know, our university's structures where he made up these academic sounding coursework titles like the ethics of free range eggs and cakes yeah. in modern society. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me think it wasn't the first time that. he trotted that out. That was hilarious. No. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed. I laughed. I thought that was funny. Well, and if you want to know what flocculation means, 
You're going to have to come to the to the website and uh, look it up because I know Kelvin has included it in the show notes. So you can, I had to know. Take a look. I had to know what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a little there's a nice little uh, MIT explainer video there that tells you more than you wanted to know about flocculation. Cool. All right. So probably, um, probably all we have time for to to uh, to dig into the world of Charles Sturt. But uh, in the show notes, there are some links that go a little deeper into some of the stuff that they're doing, and I, I strongly encourage you to check them out. Yep, I, I totally agree. Uh, shall I take a shot at the bottom line? Please do. So we might act like it at, at times, but educational innovations are not the exclusive domain of online or digital learning professionals. Curricular advancements and new approaches to teaching often originate within academic programs. Understanding more about the unique needs of individual STEM programs might help us online folks identify ways that our online and blended approaches could help. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. It's a a question I often ask deans and other stakeholders on campus here, like, what problems do you have and how can we help? Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think, Tom? You think we got a moment for a plug before we sign off? Let's do it. I think we have a couple of a couple of seconds left. You wanna you wanted to give this plug? Sure. So, top cast listener Lisa Beach, who is director of distance education at Santa Rosa Junior College, posted the following recommendation on the Apple Podcast platform regarding our lovely top cast. She said, many thanks to Kelvin and Tom for helping those of us who are in the field feel a little less alone in our work. It's lovely to know that they are there and so helpful to get their advice as well as connections to useful resources. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Lisa. That is very nice to hear. We feel a little less alone uh, podcasting knowing that you're out there feeling a little less alone. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, for sure. It's a community. We we use that word, right? But it really is. So that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, if you, dear listener, have comments about TopCast that potential listeners would find useful, please consider leaving a one or two sentence review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use to listen to these episodes. It's a great help. We might even read your review on a future episode. But if you have something to say that warrants a direct response, please email us at topcast at UCF. Dot edu. And I should say the show notes you can find at topcast.online.ucf.edu. Well, until next time for Topcast, I'm Kelvin. And I'm Tom. See ya. <laughs>